recent pages of the Watchtower encourages its readers to fact check the modern day history of Jehovah's Witnesses. With new and recent historical discoveries found in library and microfilm archives from all around the world, we will review the Faith in Action film to fill out more details of Watchtower's story. Where did Watchtower get its ideas from? What have we found about the persons mentioned in the film? Does the documented evidence support the claims made? Join us as we review part one of the Faith in Action series, Watchtower History Style. Jeff and I would like to introduce our next discussion, and we hope you really like this one. We're, we're, Jeff and I are pretty excited about ourselves doing the preliminary work of gathering some of the, the, the data in the documents. Uh, we came across some stuff that was even pretty shocking for us. Um, I, I, think, I think you guys are going to like that. It's amazing. When you try and look at the documented evidence and fact check what Watchtower has said with what the documentation states, it led to some quite interesting surprises that we hadn't expected. And we're excited to share this with you. And, and it leaves open a good question of this is, if something is known when people know what they're doing and know their history yet don't report it or alter it and change it, is that really truth or is it something else? Well, let's dig into it and see what we find. This is going to be a fun, interesting discussion. One thing that's very important that we want to point out is that in the May 2021 Watchtower, there's an article that asks the question, will you stumble because of Jesus? And in the article, it asks, How can one avoid being stumbled? The Jewish people in ancient Berea were like Luke. When they first heard the good news about Jesus, they consulted the Hebrew Scriptures to confirm what they were being told. In a similar way, people today need to examine the facts. They must compare what they are taught by God's people with what the Scriptures say. They also need to study the record of Jehovah's people in modern times. If they do a proper background check, they will not allow prejudice or hearsay to blind them. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to do a background check, a fact check on the Faith in Action video and the statements in history behind it. It ended up being a very interesting and exciting investigation. We also have some very new information to share that very little have seen. So the Faith in Action is basically a history movie. So let's take it back to where this all began and where did it all really begin? So the modern history of Jehovah's Witnesses in the film starts with Henry Grew. Henry Grew was a Baptist minister. The Faith in Action film says very, very little about who Henry Grew was and what he stood for. By 1807, at age 25, Grew was invited to serve as pastor of the Baptist Church in Hartford, Connecticut. And he had a very interesting philosophy on the study of the Bible. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Grew's point was that the Bible was its own best interpreter. Now, as he studied the Bible, he began to realize that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity was false. Well, you couldn't be a Baptist minister and not believe in the Trinity. After four years, Grew and several others withdrew from the church. In later years, Grew published writings in which he used the Bible to refute the Trinity, hellfire, and the inherent immortality of the soul. And Grew argued that immortality, according to the Bible, is a gift that God bestows on the faithful. It is not a gift that he bestows on the wicked. So how could the wicked have an immortal soul? They mentioned very, very clearly that as they studied the Bible, 
they wanted the Bible to be its own interpreter. And they realized certain elements because of that. And we saw in our David Dean discussion that we had, GRU was a part of that Christian connection movement. This movement that started at the dawn of the 19th century that was really not organized. It was like a ragtag, ragamuffin, loose-knit, anti-establishment, anti-organizational group of lay preachers, ministers, and Christians who still remained in their respective denominations, but they associated together for the common goal of studying the scriptures and only the scriptures. I find that part of history very interesting. Um, you look back and, and people read, oh, Calvin, oh, Martin Luther. Well, that was a long time ago, but let's look at what happened right here in the United States and, and from Mother England uh, coming <laughs> over. There were people who are of the same mindset and caliber as all them and Isaac Newton in, in believing this Advent type uh, movement coming forward. And it seemed to all culminate right here in the United States. And then it, it, with, with all these people sharing these ideas almost spontaneously, as, as we discussed with uh, Pastor Dean. Well, the Christian Connection Movement was definitely so focused here in the United States, but there were groups in Germany and France and England uh, that also were coming up with very similar ideas and somehow at the same time as these other groups, entirely independent of each other. What wasn't oh. Elliot, I remember one of the uh, older people in that uh, time period, wasn't Elliot from England? Elliot was in the uh, was a minister in the Church of England. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's where I got the England from. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we'll deal with him more in our discussion, asking the question: Did Russell get 1914 from the Great Pyramid? Another discussion for another time. You are writing all these discussions down, right? I have everybody. them memorized. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, we're, there's just, each, each discussion leads into a branch of things that we're making promises. It's all on my head. It's all on my head. Leave no, actually, part. we have a, we have a list and we've been checking it twice. And, Fact and we've been checking it twice. Ooh, very good. Watched our history style. Henry Grew wrote multiple booklets and pamphlets, but what Watched Tower's faith in action film doesn't mention is what Henry Grew was really known for, as well as his family. One of Henry Grew's buddies was Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist. And his daughter was also a famous abolitionist as well. There's a book written about her work in that movement against slavery called Mary Grew, Abolitionist and Feminist uh, by Ira V. Brown. Uh, Grew was a member of the Christian Connection Movement for a short time, even though he didn't hold to all of their doctrinal positions, he had a disagreement with them because they were trying to accept a Freemason into the church, and he was quite opposed to that. In, in the early 1830s, both Henry Grew and his daughter Mary were very involved in that abolitionist movement, and they shared the platform with m many of the famous anti-slavery leaders, such as Frederick Douglass, and William Lloyd Garrison. Mary Grew taught a Sunday school for African-American children, and she also opened a school for them through the New England Anti-Slavery Society. And that's at a time when African-Americans were treated as less than human. Both of the Grews, Henry and Mary, traveled to London as delegates for the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1840. And that also included African-American women as well. Uh, Mary spoke against slavery with some of the famous abolitionists such as Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, and William Lloyd Garrison. And after the Civil War, Mary got quite involved with the women's suffrage movement as well. But her father favored the right of men to exclude women, so they were on different sides of that particular subject. The famous poet John Greenleaf Whittier even wrote a poem about her.
With wisdom far beyond her years, and graver than her wondering peers, she dared the scornful laugh of men, the hounding mob, the slanderer's pen. She did the work she found to do, a Christian heroine, Mary Grew. The freed slave thanks her, blessing comes to her from women's weary homes. The wronged and erring find in her their censor mild and comforter. The world were safe if but a few could grow in grace as Mary grew. So, New Year's Eve, I sit and say, by this low wood fire, ashen gray, just wishing as the night shuts down that I could hear in Boston town, in pleasant Chestnut Avenue, from her own lips how Mary grew. And hear her graceful hostess tell the silver-voiced oracle, who lately through her parlor spoke as though Dodonna's sacred oak, a wiser truth than any told by Sappho's lips of ruddy gold. The way to make the world anew is just to grow as Mary grew. As we stated before, William Lloyd Garrison was a friend of the Grew family. So here's a letter from Henry Grew to uh, Mr. Garrison. Henry Grew writes, With pleasure, I take a retrospective view of the period. When I was induced to unite with your society in consideration of its faithful affirmation of the inherent sinfulness of slavery and consequently the duty of immediate and unconditional emancipation against this rock of righteous principle, the proud waves of vile oppression beat in vain. Hereon we must, and by the grace of God, we will abode until the last groan of the last victims of slavery shall be exchanged for the song of deliverance. I love the way he writes. Poetic. Even the handwriting on the slide, as you can see, is, is very elegant. Yeah. Uh, these people took pride in their, their penmanship. When, when they wrote and again this was you know easier than your you know they didn't have a typewriter or a little laptop or dictator to to station device to go in there so it's nice to see things like that in history another letter he says in pleading the cause of the oppressed my dear sir let us unite and cherish in our bosom all those holy dispositions which shine for our example in the faithful witness of the truth in that blessed pattern of holy love, we see combined unwavering decision, untiring patience, long-suffering mercy, and ardent zeal. In the spirit of meekness, let us reprove those who oppose themselves, praying that God may give them repentance to the acknowledging discouragements, that the cause we advocate is the cause of righteousness and love, and must ultimately prevail. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due time we shall reap if we faint not. In 1862, Agru passed away. And in a short obituary about him in the World's Crisis and Second Advent Messenger, and he used to preach and write for, for this periodical as well, it says about him that, Oh, that Christian love and meekness about him, that mild and forgiving spirit in his heart, his forbearing with the faults of others, his deep humility, his strong faith in God, his activity in the Lord's vineyard day by day, though old and weak, his willingness to comfort and assist the poor, his almost unlimited charity. All these characteristics were found in our beloved brother. Once again, it seems like these founding fathers of Adventism had that spirit Right. That, that yeah. just drew people to them. In the Faith in Action film, the suggestion is made by Watchtower that the reason Gru left the Baptist Church was, well, you couldn't believe in the Trinity and be a member of the Baptist Church. Well, you couldn't be a Baptist minister and not believe in the Trinity. After four years, Gru and several others withdrew from the church. Well, that's not entirely true because we did have that discussion with Pastor Dean in discussing what that Christian connection movement was about. A lot of them stayed in their respective denominations, but still, you know, loosely associated with each other, very anti-organizational. They were talking about these ideas and writing about them while they remained in their own denominations. They didn't want to create a new denomination. 
that was not their goal. So why did he leave the Baptist church? Well, the June 5th, 1863 world's crisis has another obit about him. And, and this obituary says, Grew was born in, in Birmingham, England in 1781. When Grew was 21, he turned from earthly to heavenly prospects and moved to Providence, Rhode Island, where he entered the ministry. And he became pastor of a Baptist church around 1811. The members of that church admitted his views were scriptural, but didn't think it expedient to embrace those ideas. One of the things he disagreed with, not just the Trinity thing, it was he didn't recognize singing in the fashion as singing with the Spirit. And this was a prominent dissenting matter. He thought it was too precious for them. And in a word, this is why he withdrew from the church, because of the singing question. But he continued preaching the kingdom of God. So he went to another little church and remained with them until the 1830s. The obit says Gru was a Bible man and about 1830 decided, as others had done before him, that life and death in scripture as future were not equivalent as to existence, which was the usual view. This he declared manifesting his belief in immortality only through Christ. And so he didn't believe in the immortal soul. He believed that you could only have immortality if you got it from Christ. Gru was described also as holding the the temperance idea. He was decidedly opposed to Freemasonry, preeminently known as anti-slavery, and as an Adventist he was approved and loved among us, and especially known as defending the Bible view of life and death as reward and penalty. And he died when he was 81. Now, if you go back to the previous slide Mm -hmm. describing Gru, um, apparently his thought on immortality, a lot of it Paul, the Apostle Paul and his writings and letters get into that. And very descriptively and very definitively go over what the reward and everything is, immortality and what what it consists of. So they're describing him. He is waiting with Paul. So he must have really made them known that he's coming right from the Bible, right from the Apostle Paul. This is why I feel that. To such a point, they remembered it. Yeah, and and he wrote wrote a lot about it. And we're going to get into some of those writings and some of those debates uh, coming up soon. Gru was very anti-Masonic. And he even wrote a a pamphlet about it. So there is a narrative of proceedings at the Bank Street Church, Philadelphia, relative to the reception of an adhering Freemason. And we're not going to read what's on the screen here, but he definitely was opposed to them not leaving the the Masonic organization and becoming a a full uh, dedicated Christian, completely dedicated to Christ and, and the Father. So... As said earlier, Gru was very involved in the anti-slavery movement and the abolitionist movement. And there was another gentleman at the same time who was also very active in that movement. His name was George Storrs. When we researched this portion of the Faith in Action film that discusses George Storrs, we found a very interesting dilemma that we hadn't seen before when looking at the microfilm of the original documents that Watchtower quotes. What did Watchtower miss? Stay tuned.